Another very famous sketch is the so-called Count Min sketch. In contrast to the previous two sketches, the Count Min sketch does not compute an estimate for the number of distinct elements, but computes an estimate for the number of occurrences of a specific object. So if you have a sequence of objects, A1, A4 and so on, and just think of these um, sequences as being like the values within a table attribute, a column. After we create the convince sketch, it will give us estimates how often A1 appears, A4 appears and so on. So what's the idea behind the sketch? We have a set of hash functions and consider in the example here we have four hash functions, h0, h1, h2, h3, and each of these hash functions map the input objects um, onto the domain 0 to 7, as you can also see here. right? So now there's elements coming in the sequence, basically that means we are scanning the column of a table and we see a1, let's say. Then we apply hash function 0 on a1 and the hash function will, for example, point us to position 4. And then we go and increment the entry here from 0 to 1. These values here, or these counters here, are integer values, so it's not a binary representation or like a binary a 2D array. So this can be more than one. This is important. So now we have a one here. And now we have um, more hash functions, right? So we have h2 as h1 as well, so the second hash function. So we again apply h1 on the same value a1. And let's say this points us here. And we do the same for h2 still only looking at a1, right? And let's say h2 guides us on position here. And let's continue this for h3, and h3, let's say, puts a 1 here. And now we go for the next object, a4. We again apply h0 on a4, and this points us, let's say, here, so we put a 1 here. And now for hash function 1, again for this a4, let's say this points us here to the position for hash function 2, and then we would increment this and have a 2 here instead of a 1. And this continues, let's say we have a 1 here and a 1 here, and now we see the next element is a4 again. And since it's a4 and it's a hash function, so it's a function, the output is the same. So then h0 will make a 2 out of the 1 here and make a 3 here and so on, right? So we have a 2 here and a 2 here. And then this whole procedure continues. And now how does the estimation work? When we want to estimate how often an element appeared in our sequence, we will look up the individual positions to which us the hash functions point and take the minimum of these counters. And that's the estimate of, of our um, number of occurrences for a certain object. So here's a more formal description of how the count bin sketch works. We have a two-dimensional array that we call count. We have d rows, one for each hash function, and the width of w. This is like the range onto which the hash functions map. For like an input value, ai, we iterate over all the hash functions, hj. We apply hj on this ai value, and we set the entry of our 2D array with the coordinates or the positions j and hj ai plus one. And then after we process the entire sequence and we want to know how often AI appeared in the sequence, we will again, for each of these hash functions, HJ, look up the position to get the counter and then take the minimum of these counters. And this is the estimate of the number of occurrences of object AI.
So let's click through some example. You see a sequence here of objects and here this array count and we are going now to insert these individual elements and you can see what's happening to this array. This array now on this slide represents the state after the insertion of this P. And you see there's a one here, a one here, and a one here, and a one here. And as we go on now, here now this is the state of the, the insertion of G. So you see the, the array is filling up, but so far there are only ones and zeros. But if we go on and further insert elements, in this case W, you see that some of these counters here have a value of two. And this is interesting because this happened due to hash collisions, because here we don't have any duplicates, right? We have uh, P, G, and W, and still we have some of these counters being two. Well, that's unavoidable because the range onto which the hash functions map is limited, and it's expected to have hash collisions. But that's not really a problem. Well, it is kind of a problem because if we're unlucky and we get the uh, many hash collisions for a certain object and we want to know how many times this appeared, then the estimate will be far off. But the number of hash functions is one measure to control this problem because the more hash functions we have, it's getting less and less likely that we have for all of these hash functions hash collisions. And remember that we're always taking the minimum uh, value to which these hash functions point and this is limiting the effect of these hash collisions. But still, um, this is something to consider and this is inherent to this sketch. So let's go on. We're inserting E and so on. Now we jump to having already inserted quite a lot of these um, values and you see these counters and getting always bigger and bigger. And then we finally have inserted all of our elements of the sequence. So here on the upper left side you see the sketch that we just created. And here on the right side you see as a utility table um, how are the different hash functions mapping the elements. So you see hash function 0 would map A to position 4, so to this column here, and H1 would map it to the 0 column and so on. So this allows us the structure here on the right side to really now query this sketch for our frequency estimates. So let's um, consider the case of A, the element A, and we want to know how many times A appeared. So we will apply H0 on A. This will guide us to the position 4, which is here, as I said earlier. And then we see a value 6 here. And then we apply hash function 1 to A. This gives us the 0 position and this means we have we have here this 9. And when we do the same for H2, this points to the 7 position for H, H2 and this is this 6 here. And then finally H3 also points to the position 7 which gives us this 6 here. So we have now four values retrieved, 6, 9, 6, and 6. The estimator takes the minimum of these values for its estimate. In this case, this is 6. So A, or estimator will say, appeared at most six times. And we take 6 as the estimate. Now the question is why um, take, do we take the minimum? Why don't we take, let's say, the maximum? Why don't we take 9 as the estimate? Well, this would be really um, not, not good. It would be stupid because if we take 9, that means we would assume that um, A happened 9 times. But if A would happen eight, uh, 9 times, then all of these would be at least 9, right? Because every time A appeared, these counters would be updated. So taking 9 doesn't really make sense. 
What about taking the average of these values? It also doesn't make sense because the average would be larger than the minimum, unless all the numbers are the same, of course. And um, why would it make sense to take a larger number than the minimum? Because if there would be an occurrence which is larger than the minimum, yeah, this doesn't happen, right? Because the minimum would also be larger because we always increase the counters for all the positions. So the minimum is the only thing which makes sense to take. Yeah. So we take the smallest value among the counters we find when we're applying all of the hash functions to the query object. Right. And as mentioned, this estimate is an upper bound for the true, for the correct frequency. And as mentioned, it doesn't make sense to take any larger value, um, for instance, the largest or the average. Now, this structure is very simple, right? Um, I hope you all understand how it's done and also why the minimum makes sense. But if you're looking at the original paper, it uh, doesn't stop here. The paper proposes also a theoretic investigation of the guarantees on how good the estimate is. So if we have a count min sketch with two parameters, and this, these parameters now influence the size of the two-dimensional array, then we can say the following. So if, if we have the width of the array set to this equation and the depth so the number of rows set to this. And then we can make the following um, guarantees that the estimate A hat for AI, for the element AI, this is larger or equal than the true value. That's not surprising. This we have seen earlier already. And this is by the design of the, uh, the design of the sketch. But then now it comes with the guarantees with the probability of at least one minus delta, where delta is a parameter um, you can you can tune epsilon as well. We have also the guarantee that the true value is only larger or equal than the estimate by a, a small factor, right? And this can be tuned. Here, this e is Euler's number. So this is something that um, we will not really make use of in the course, but it's still for completeness important to mention that these estimators uh, also come, or some of them come with guarantees how good they work. And if you have a certain requirement on your estimate, then you can set the parameters epsilon and delta according to your requirements. And given these two formulas, this will um, lead, uh, lead you to the number of columns and rows of this 2D array. And then um, you can expect the um, sketch work within these two guarantees, right? And this one is anyway given by the design of the sketch.